everyone, and welcome to Hashtag No Limits. Hashtag No Limits is about people whose society has placed limits upon, but who have busted through those limits. I believe that there is a great example of the caterpillar turning into the butterfly to illuminate this idea. And Ophelia says in Hamlet, we know who we are, but not who we will be. And again, I believe that 100%. And I, through all of my experience as a teacher, as an advocate, as an education consultant, I see this happening over and over and over again. Now, obviously, it isn't an easy task for someone to bust through limits, just like it's not an easy task for the caterpillar to dissolve into nothing, reform as a butterfly, and then fight its way out of the cocoon in order for its wings to be strong enough to fly. But we have hundreds of thousands, probably tens of thousands or more people doing this every single day. And then we have wonderful support people like my guests today that help those bust through those limits. And I am so honored and pleased to have Whitney and Crystal with me today. I just met them a couple of weeks ago and we talked for two hours. It felt like it was a blink of an eye and we could have easily talked for the rest of the day because what they do is something that I am absolutely in love with as far as the backstory to what they do on a daily basis. So. Crystal and Whitney, thank you both for being here. Um, Whitney, tell us a little bit about yourself and who you work for. And then Crystal, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get going after that. Okay. Hi, I'm Whitney Albrecht. I am a board certified behavior analyst with Visions. Um, as a company, we work with adults with um, autism, developmental disabilities, mental health issues. We're currently broadening our population. So we do some health and wellness. We're working in some criminal justice probation stuff, um, some traumatic brain injuries. I personally started in this field. Um, it'll be 12 years this year. I started working at a children's residential home. Um, I worked there for seven years. Then I worked in an autism clinic for four years. And then I've been here with Visions for about a year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Crystal? I'm Crystal. Um, I've worked for Visions for almost four years. Um, I first got into the mental health and developmental disability population when I was 19. So 16 years ago, um, I've worked in residential. I worked in community-based settings. Um, I really got into applied behavior analysis when I worked at a children's residential with Whitney. Um, I ended up enrolling in the schooling and doing my internship there. Um, and then now I work with Visions and our boss is great. He gives us a lot of opportunity to expand on what we can use ABA with. Um, we can work with kids, like Whitney said, we're working health and wellness, some criminal justice. Um, we're looking into other avenues of ways that we can use it to help people. So. That is so awesome. So anyone who has watched Hashtag No Limits knows that I love behaviors. And so that's what I meant when I said what you guys do um, in the backside of, of your everyday job, It that investigation of what is causing this behavior? What is this behavior trying to communicate? What are best practices or good ideas to help handle those behaviors? And when we talked a couple of weeks ago, you both mentioned something to me that I didn't realize um, as a person who loves behaviors, I have used different strategies and one of them being ABA with all of my students and with my daughter and my husband, don't tell them. <laughs> um, and, you know, I have most certainly felt that it could be some of the, the um, strategies, some of the principles can be applied to everyone. And you guys mentioned to me that you, when you went through schooling for your BCBA, what were some of the places where you learned during your schooling that ABA can be utilized? Um, so when I went through school, because we went to different schools, um, we were told you can use it in prof with professional athletes. You can use it in human resources. Um, we've heard about working with the forensic population children with autism, mental health. Did you hear anything? Um, yeah, I, my program that I went through, it really did focus more on the um, autism 
um, aspect and a lot of that verbal, nonverbal behavior was a lot pretty old school in that way. Um, but through the schooling and doing some of the assignments and things and looking at different things, I mean, the forensic aspect has always been a passion of mine, even before I knew behavior analysis was a thing. So the fact that Crystal and I are currently working on breaking that wall down to get into that part of the field is pretty exciting. So for anyone who's not familiar with what ABA is, would you guys give um, a brief, because <laughs> I know it's very elaborate and extensive, right. but um, just a brief idea of what it is and maybe give a couple of examples of some of the different levels um, and by level, I mean ages that you know you might work with and how you might work with someone using ABA strategies. Um, okay, so the official definition, um, according to a book that we used um, in school called Applied Behavior Analysis, um, the official definition is the science in which tactics derived from the principles of behavior are applied to improve socially significant behavior and experimentation is used to identify the variables responsible for the improvement of behavior. So that's a mouthful. Yeah, can you put that in English, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just, we decided to show like, here's the official definition. Right. <laughs> what does that mean? We look at behaviors and determine the why and teach replacement behaviors. So we wanna decrease inappropriate behaviors and increase the appropriate behaviors. Right. Whitney, do you have more to add to that or was that? No, that's pretty much it. I mean, a, the biggest piece of that and what we do is figuring out the why and that why could be multifaceted. It could be just really simple too, but it's just figuring out that why is that big key on changing that behavior or increasing, decreasing, like Crystal said. So, I mean, that's that's the big focus and sometimes the hardest part because you might look and observe and be like, oh yeah, the why is this. And then six months down the line, you're like, well, I couldn't have been farther off. So that why piece is definitely the big one. Right, so tell us some some strategies or some skills that you might use um, maybe with someone in a group home because I know we talked about that um, or maybe someone who um, is a student in the primary grades. Um, so when we worked at the children's residential, like Crystal said, they worked very much on a level system. Um, it was something that being in school for what we now do was very cringeworthy because everyone's different. It was not an individualized at all. Um, so I think the biggest part in any type of behavior modification plan, no matter what age, but I mean, obviously younger, the better is making sure it's individualized and understanding the whole story. I mean, history, trauma's big. A lot of people just kind of brush trauma to the side, like the background doesn't matter. And I like to always say, even if I had the little pill that fixed all behaviors, if we're not dealing with that trauma, it's not gonna work. Um, so I think just the more individualized, the better with working with anyone. Yeah, that's a good point. Crystal? Um, yeah, like she said, we like to gather some background information because some trauma is not addressed and it could there could be triggers that remind the client of their trauma. And if that's not getting addressed, um, it's not going to help. So that's something huge that we are focusing on. And then we have different text techniques. So for example, um, some clients don't like to hear the word no. We, kids don't like to hear the word no. So something we may use is called the pre-MAC principle. So first, then. So um, I had a client before that wanted, he lived in a red or like a Scylla and he wanted to go to the gas station and get a soda in the morning. And the staff couldn't because they were cooking breakfast. There was other clients in the house. So it was understandable, but she said, no, but after breakfast we can go. But I said, what you have to understand is you said no, and then he stopped listening to you. So with pre back principle, principle, you could um, say, first, we're going to have breakfast, then we're going to go. I said, because when you say no, he's not going to listen. And then you also want to offer options. A lot of clients that we work with have guardians. Um, so they can't make all their decisions themselves. 
So offer options. So yes, he wanted a soda from the gas station. He couldn't get that. He could have coffee, water, milk, juice, like lay out the other options instead of just saying no to the soda. And that's so awesome. And, and as you said, that could, that alone, that principle can be used with anyone in a variety <laughs> of situations. Um, and a lot of the people that watch this show have younger children. Um, but that principle would absolutely apply to, you know, first we eat our dinner, then we have the dessert. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of saying no dessert until after dinner, because of exactly what you said, when our brain hears a certain thing, um, it, it stops listening in a lot of instances. And you mentioned triggers. Um, can you give an example of maybe some of the, I don't even know, are there, um, more prevalent triggers or is it just because everybody's individual that's just individual triggers and i think it's definitely more individualized i know working in the children's residential a common one would be holidays they're away from their family things like that um, but if there was abuse in their history the time of year would sometimes be a trigger um, taking a bath versus a shower may be a trigger um, even hearing the word no can be a trigger. I mean, it really is just so individualized to that person. And the big thing with trauma too is understanding what might sound traumatic to me might not be traumatic to someone else because they don't know any different. Like I might hear somebody's history and be like, oh my God, I can't imagine how they survived. But to them, they didn't know any different. So that's a really important piece with that trauma too. And another technique we use is that is functional communication training. Because like you said, Shelly, at the beginning, behaviors or communication, they don't know how to properly say what they're trying to say. So just trying to teach those appropriate ways of communication and functional communication can help a ton as well. So is ABA, and I know the answer to this, but <laughs> can you just come in with one session and boom, everything's fixed and everything's great? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, it takes time. Um, and again, it's individualized based on the client's needs, the supports they have in place, if there's funding, resources they have access to. Um, so typically what we do is we come in and we may do like a file review to get some of that background information. We may do some interviews with, if it's a residential staff guardian, if it's a child meeting with their parent, if they have a work, like a state worker, um, then we will meet also with the client, obviously. Um, and then we will do a lot of observations because um, at first you can't observe once and get all the answers because there's the observer effect. So they're aware that you are there and watching them. So they typically act like perfect angels when we're there. Or the opposite, they act more, they even more, way more than they normally do. Mm -hmm. Right. So we rely heavily on um, communication and documentation because the behaviors have, you know, some clients, the behaviors only happen at night or they happen with a certain staff member or when they're in certain locations. So um, having that communication is key because sometimes we get to observe the client. We can observe maybe something in the environment is what is triggering them. So it could be something that could be an easy fix. We might need to do parent or staff training but it is a process that takes time, that's for sure. And it takes a village, that's for sure. I mean, it's all about the teamwork and everyone remembering why we're there in the first place and that's for the individual that we're trying to help. Yep. Right, so one of the things that I remember and I just wanna say welcome to Michael, he has joined us and he reminded me, I always forget the business side of, of the show is um, if you're watching live, tell us hashtag and where you're from or hashtag live. If you're watching in the replay, hashtag replay. And most certainly if you have any questions for Whitney or Crystal, please put them in the chat. Um, even if you're watching in the replay, I can ask them the questions later and make sure that you give this a thumb up or a like or you subscribe if you're watching on the YouTube channel and my earpiece does not want to stay in today. <laughs> Darn it, this behavior, I have to figure this out. Right. Um, so oftentimes what I would hear as a teacher from the other teachers when they would come to me and say, you know, this, this child is exhibiting this behavior, that they said the function was so often attention. Can yeah. you speak to that a little bit? So that's such a tricky one because 
it probably is for attention, but that attention could be for something else. Like I have clients that are nonverbal and they'll be like, oh, well they do X, Y, Z to get attention. It's like, right, attention to them. So that, cause they're trying to communicate to you something else. So sure, it may seem on the surface that it's for attention and we might look at that and see that, but that's where that digging and those extra observations go because yeah, it might be for attention, but it might not be for the sake of attention. It may be for some other reason, or I've had, you know, well, he has a one-on-one -on -one staff, so he's getting attention all the time. There's a difference between having an individual sitting by you for eight hours and someone actually giving you active attention, you know? So it that attention one, it is tricky because a lot of times on the surface, it is attention, but that's where you really have to dig down and figure out, is he trying to get attention for the sake of attention or is he trying to communicate something and get that attention to him for, for some other reason? Right. We have four functions of behavior that we typically look at. So there's attention, there's escape. So if you're trying to give them a task to do and they don't want to do it, they'll have that. Um, tangible, so meaning they want something, um, if they want to drink or something, or um, they'll call it sensory or automatic. So if it's just kind of has to do with their diagnosis, um, if they have a mental health diagnosis, stuff like that is included. So we evaluate the behaviors and then identify the function of behavior because then that will help us with our treatment plan. Right. And honestly, I think I'd rather have someone come tell me and always assume that the function is attention instead of my least favorite thing. It happened out of nowhere. Where? There was no <laughs> trigger. I'm just like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so speak to that a little bit. So when somebody comes to you and says that, what does your brain go automatically to a thought of? Um, okay. After my brain like mentally <laughs> ramps my head into a wall, um, I, I start to just talk to the person just about what's been happening over the last, you know, starting right before and just kind of talking about well, what happened before that and what happened before that. And, you know, sometimes that trigger might be 10 seconds before the behavior. Sometimes that trigger was an hour or two before the behavior, but it's just getting them to understand that in that moment, it might seem like it's out of nowhere, but if you actually sit and think, a behavior doesn't just happen. Even sensory, a lot of times sensory stuff is anxiety induced, you know? And so just having to actually take that time and think, well, what have we been doing that could have triggered that? And I understand, especially in schools, you have a classroom with 20, 30 students. I mean, it's hard to be able to tell that, but it's just trying to get them to slow down and break down everything that's happened up until that behavior, or even sometimes, well, what were we getting ready to do? Like maybe they were getting ready to go to PE and that kid doesn't like PE and he just knows because there's a schedule on the board, that's what's next. So a trigger might not even happen right before, it could be something they know is going to happen. So it's just really getting people to stop and think about the behavior and everything around it, not just the behavior itself. And that's a lot of times why in our documentation sheets, we use ABC data. So the antecedent, the behavior and the consequence. So um, some people don't realize that not only is there a trigger, but sometimes the consequence that they are inadvertently reinforcing the behavior to happen again, such as like use escape. Well, if the client is asked to clean the bathroom and they had a behavior and threw a chair or something, um, and then they didn't have to clean the behavior or they didn't have the bathroom, then that reinforces that, well, if I don't want to do something, I'll just throw a chair. Um, so that's a lot of times why we look at the whole picture because staff will say it just happened out of nowhere. Well, sometimes clients let things fester and they think about it and they, you know, it blows up into a big thing. So it could have happened like Whitney said, seconds, hours, or even days before. And then it just comes to a point that they don't know how to communicate or communicate their feelings or manage it. So they just explode. Yeah. it's. I mean, I could just sit here and just talk behaviors with you guys the whole time and different strategies and different things, because it is so important. And everything that we have talked about so far, I can see with kids who are typical development and those who are not typically developing. Um, because I, it's just, that's why I used it with every student that I've ever worked with and why in my own sort of behavior management system that I developed over the years, I had bits and pieces from ABA 
intertwined mm -hmm. in and then, you know, just other things that I had picked up and had other trainings that I had gone through. But so tell us about visions. Tell us more about visions, where you're located, how people could get a hold of you. I can pop up the website if you would like me to do that. Um, we actually made a PowerPoint show that we should have. Awesome. Can okay. I share it? Oh, I can share. Okay. Yeah, you should be able to share it. Sorry, this is my first time using this platform. No, that's so. fine. So what will happen is when you share it, it'll show up for me, and then I'll have to put it up into the show itself. Okay. Oh, boy. Here we go. <laughs> um, share screen. Two monitors. Okay. So I have... If you have more than one monitor, I can't help you. <laughs> well, I can, it, it lets me select which monitor. Oh, okay. There. <laughs> So let me make it full screen. There it goes. <laughs> Technology, oh, it's great when it works. Yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing anything yet. Okay, no, I, I was expanding okay. it. Okay. There we go. All right. Okay, cool. Okay, so we are Visions LLC. Um, this is our boss. His name is Dave Jakes. It's Jakes, even though it looks like Jacquez. We get that a lot. <laughs> um, he has his PhD and he is also a BCBA. He's our executive director. Um, we used to have also another supervisor, but we unfortunately lost him earlier this year, very suddenly and unexpectedly. So this is kind of one of the phrases that we have um, on some of our brochures. So we bring together a vast array of education and experience in working with persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities, autism spectrum disorders, mental health challenges, traumatic and acquired brain injuries, neurocognitive disorders, health and wellness, and criminal justice. All behavioral services are directly provided by board certified behavior analysts and state approved behavioral professionals. Um, Vision's consulting staff work directly with the service recipient and all key stakeholders in developing approaches to behavior concerns that create and maintain desired behavior change while simultaneously enhancing quality of life factors. So pretty much we, like we said, we can use ABA with almost everyone and we work, we like to work as a team. Team is huge. So we like to work with behavior analysts. We like to work with the SILA provider or the parent. Um, if there's a state worker, if the client goes to workshop, um, we like to have contact with everybody because something that is very helpful with clients is having communication and consistency. Um, so we have behavior analysts and then we have some behavior technicians that are approved through the state. And we work with the client where their need is, if they're having problems at workshop, if they're having problems in the home, wherever, we help in the best way that we can. And I think that's so critical that if you are in a lot of places throughout your day, if you're at home and you're at school, and if you're at school, if you are in multiple classes, that everyone is on the same page with the program. And everyone is using, I don't know if you have same terminology that you suggest is used, but um, I had a student very, very early in my career that it was crucial for us, according to the behavior interventionist at that time, this was 30 years ago almost, um, that we all say the same thing in the same way um, and that you know every step was followed as consistently as possible. And is that still kind of what's underlying in, in the ruling of that? Absolutely. I mean, it can even be something to where if you think you're saying the same thing as what maybe the behavior analyst suggests you say and you change one word, a client could just open that up as interpretation. One of our biggest things we preach is you never ask an individual to do something you give because then you give them the opportunity to say no. No, so exactly. it's you know, how it's all in how you approach it. And I think sometimes I know whenever I was a BCBA in the autism clinic and I would be training new behavior therapists for it. And, you know, they'd be, well, show me green. And then they would be like, where's green No. And then they look at me and I'm like, okay. I mean, they're not doing anything wrong. You asked a question. They said, no, right. you know, and so it's really, but I can see if you're not in kind of like the backside of things, you don't 
see where those little bitty things that seem like not that big of a deal are a huge deal. Right. And I remember, and, and tell me if this is uh, experiences that you both have had, is we want to be polite. And so a lot of people say, well, you want to do that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, something along that lines of, well, you know, I, I can't just direct them to do something. I, you know, I need to say, please, or, you know, uh, show me green, please. Well, isn't that kind of a question still? <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's hard to have a balance because something we also work with sometimes is sometimes parents or staff have power struggles. So they find that out to say no, to escape the task. Um, so it's just about having that consistency with the prompts because if you don't say it like the other five staff, so if five staff are saying it one way and somebody's saying it a different way, the client may, it. some clients, depending on their functioning level, may not understand what's being asked, or some may see an opportunity to not complete the task. So. <laughs> so now wait a minute. Did you just say that sometimes it's not the fault of the person exhibiting the behavior? Did you just imply that? <laughs> yes. Some people don't understand how their behaviors can trigger client behaviors. It could be something you say, it could be from a power struggle. Um, that's why knowing some background history is important because you may say something that may be a trigger to their trauma. Um, like I said, a power struggle. If you are too demanding, because you know it is about your approach, um, you might get push back from that. So yes. And how important is it? And maybe you're going to get to this. So I apologize if I'm jumping ahead. Um, how important is it to remain calm as Ooh. the person? <laughs> I put that in just about every one of my behavior plans is like step one of a behavior being as exhibit is stay calm, quiet, and um, calm, quiet, and I, I don't want to, but it's something like that that I put in there because it's like a lot of times a behavior will happen and a, a staff will just, oh my God, what are you doing? It's like, oh, well, we're going to have to deal with that for eight months to undo what you did in one interaction, you know, or like even with what Crystal said with the power struggle, you know, it's okay to have a conversation. You want the individual to ask questions about why things are in place and you, you want to welcome that conversation. But you also know that in doing that, you need to keep kind of like almost like a fence around it. Like, okay, we can do this, but I also need to be aware of my emotions because are they really wanting to know just why? Or are they trying to find a way to kind of squirm their way out of something? So, um, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, there's been so many instances where I've, I've come in, um, I'm not a BCBA, but as people have called me to help them with their child's IEP and making sure, you know, that it's going the right way. And when I start to dig through some of the behavioral data and I read reports, I think, how does someone not realize that they were making the behavior increase by what they were doing? Or that like people raise their voice. Mm -hmm. So then the client feels that they need to raise their voice. Like, We've seen a lot. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, I think we could have talked that whole day and we could probably do that today. So I'm trying to be really <laughs> cognizant and keep us on task. <laughs> That's why we really focus um, after developing, developing our treatment plan, focus a lot on training, whether it be parent training, staff training, wherever is needed, because some people don't understand. Some people don't realize till they're in the training, things click but that also helps with the consistency in all environments, on the bus, at school, at home, at daycare, wherever the issue is, um, there's training with everybody because that will help with the consistency and that's what helps the client. And generalization is huge. I mean, you don't want a behavior to stop happening in one environment, but then continue to happen or even sometimes escalate in other environments. So that consistency really helps with that generalization into other environments and around other staff, family, things like that. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll stop. You can continue on with your slides. <laughs> oh. um, I Well, the first, I'll show you what we did. 
but we kind of covered the first few. Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, no, no, you're fine. fine. So it was just kind of our title page. Um, and then this is where I read the very oh, wordy okay. definition. As behavior, an as behavior analysts, we want to simplify it and use terms because there's a lot of terms in that definition that can be confusing. So we want to yeah. use wording that everybody understands. We don't want to use technological terminology to confuse people. Right. Um, another slide we had was kind of limitations we see um, in the field. So one thing is um, funding. It's still some some places see it as a newer field, even though it's been around for a long time. Um, some insurances will only cover ABA if there is an autism diagnosis and that's it. Um, some places will provide, will pay for services, but the hours will be limited. Um, so funding is one, and I know that's just kind of in the mental health field overall. Um, another thing it, like we've been talking about is consistency and follow through. Like not only do we do the trainings and that, but the parent, the staff, they're with the client more. So we need them to follow through after the training, not just for a day or a week, but the consistency and follow through um, will make a big difference. Um, and then Whitney, do you want to talk about the other ones? Um, sorry, I had to go st check on my son. Did you cover buy-in? about the top two. Okay, so, so buy-in. Buy-in <laughs> is such a huge one. And we actually see that in Illinois, more than a lot of other states, especially in the school systems, as we talked with you about, Shelly, when we met the other week, is a lot of schools aren't big fans of letting us in. So getting that buy-in and understanding that everyone should have the same end game, and that's to help the individual. You know, it's not us versus them. It's we should all be there for that individual. Documentation is a huge one. Getting staff and parents or even like some of our clients do a lot of um, self-reporting, that accurate documentation, um, especially with like the ABC sheets, like we were talking, well, it happened out of nowhere. And so you get this sheet and it's like, oh, they did this really weird behavior I've never seen before, but then the antecedent and the consequence are, are blank because it happened out of nowhere. So that documentation can be really hard. And then kind of Crystal touched on a little bit, a lot of people think we're still a new field. So lack of knowledge of the field, um, a lot of people get us confused with like a mental health therapist to where, I mean, the mental health aspect is something we definitely look into, the trauma, all of that. But again, it's a team approach and we all need to work together in that aspect, but also kind of staying in our lane. So knowing like, yes, this traumatic thing is a huge part of what's going on. And I can touch on that a little bit, but that's where I, I mean, I'm big on advocating for therapy for my clients because a lot of people like a lot of agencies just don't get their clients therapy when these horrific things have happened to them. Um, so just lack of knowledge on where our role is in that field. So and before, I, oh, oh sorry. sorry, Crystal, go ahead. And I just want to add on not only just what our role is, but like where we can help. Um, we are like, behavior analysts work, a lot of them work with kids with autism in clinics or in schools, but there's so much more you can do with it that a lot of people don't realize. Um, so understanding that part two or, you know, yeah, I guess that's all I want to say is that a lot of people don't realize that you can work with more than just children with autism or um, individuals with intellectual disabilities. There's, you could use ABA in anything. Right. So now, now I have two things I have to say. <laughs> Good thing there's only two, and I have more fingers I can cross. Uh -huh. um, so Whitney, something that you said that um, triggered is when you you can go to IEP meetings with families, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. But, yeah. Tell your role then at the meeting what you can and cannot do. So ethically, the only thing we can do in an IEP meeting is speak on the behaviors. Um, so if there's, and things that we could suggest to the school, like things that maybe the teacher will talk about that, how things run the classroom, we, and we can suggest like, well, it may be if you word it this way and things like that. Um, but like I said, there's just a lot of, at least with my experience, Crystal, I think you've had it too. There's just been a lot of resistance with, 
um, our involvement in the schools. Like the parents will be the ones to request us to come. Um, and a lot of times you, you maybe see some side eyes and eye rolls when we walk in the room because well, I really don't know why. I don't even know why I said because, because I don't understand why it is that way. Um, so yeah, we can attend, we can speak on the behaviors and our, give our suggestions, but that's pretty much as far as that goes. The school right. has to follow through and a lot of schools have behavior analysts, um, but why we feel like it's important for us to be involved too is like we said, that generalization across environments. We want the client to have that consistency at home, at, at school, on the bus. Um, so being able to talk about what we see in the home and what the school sees, um, we feel like it's important to get the best help for the client. Yeah, I agree. So Crystal, what you said that had me crossing to remember is um, you mentioned that there's a lot of different areas where ABA can be helpful. Most people typically only think, and unfortunately, apparently it's the same way with insurance companies because they're only paying for it if the person has a diagnosis of autism. But um, what are some other places that you have been in and that you're attempting to get into? I don't know if you can tell about the thing that we talked about that day. <laughs> um, I can't, I just won't share a ton of details. So okay. we are, um, attempting to get into the criminal justice field. Um, that's something that we have a passion about and that's something that ABA could really help because um, you know, individuals have behaviors that lead to legal issues. So if we work on the behaviors, there won't be any recidivism in the future. Um, you can use ABA in human resources. You can use ABA in sports, you can use ABA in prisons, you can use it in so many different settings that, but there's just not a lot, like for example, the project Whitney and I are working on for criminal justice, there's not a lot of research or resources out there. Um, so we're just kind of starting our own. <laughs> That's awesome. So we do have a question. Um, Michael says, do they, do you, do they give you pushback due to the extra effort they need to put in for the betterment of the child? Um, I think that's part of it. I think a lot of times when people see us come in, they almost think like we're there to um, tell them that they're doing something wrong. We're there to criticize them. Um, they just get very closed off in that aspect. But like I said, I mean, that's never why we would be there. We're there to help the child or the individual um, but a lot of times, some of the things that we might suggest will put more effort on the staff and the school and things like that. So I think that is part of it. But I think a big part of it is that they just are worried we're going to go in and tell them that they're doing something wrong. And Crystal, I don't know if that's what your thoughts are, too. Yeah, they. I think a lot of times they think it's like us versus them when really we want to enmesh yeah. our services to get the best help for the client and not just have like, you do this at school and this at home because then that's hard. What about if, you know, yeah, they go to school Monday through Friday, but then Monday's a teacher institute day. What are things going to look like? So that's why if you have consistency across environments, that's what's going to help. So they have to understand, like I said, we're really big on teamwork, working with everyone, um, communication with with all aspects of the team is important. So having them understand that we aren't there to battle them, to tell them they're doing something wrong, we're there to assist. And maybe they can give us some pointers that what's working for them at school might help in the home setting. Right, exactly. And that's one of the reasons I think one of the other reasons there were multiples that we connected so well, because that's what I try to do as an education consultant and master IEP coach is go in and be collaborative with everyone because I'm there for the student. And yes, everybody is there for the student, but sometimes our pride gets in the way, fear gets in the way, um, whatever else, I don't know, you know, is getting in the way. And having taught for as many years as I have and worked as in many schools as I have, um, I do think that Michael's a little on the, on the right path is that, you know, but you guys too, that they do think that we're coming in 
to tell them what they're doing wrong and that when we give those suggestions, they're, it's going to add to their already very stressful mm -hmm. day. And it's I think gonna, that puts into that lack of knowledge too of what we do and what our role is. Yeah. And this, I really like this statement. Teamwork makes uh -huh. the dream work. And that's really, really true. Yes. Well, and that's why um, in the area that we are, there are a few schools for clients that have behaviors. So I think um, some school professionals feel like if a client has a behavior, they need to go to the specialized school when really it could be something that could be easily addressed in their general education setting. Right. And I have <laughs> noticed that, and I think this was in actually one of the trainings that I went through that you need to look at how much time you're spending after a behavior because of you know it happening over and over again versus how much time you would spend before the behavior teaching them the behaviors that you want and you're actually reducing the amount of time by being proactive instead of reactive mm -hmm. and it's hard to get people to to really kind of the buy-in which is what where we're at on your slide but i mean it's hard to get people to to see that well, and a lot of people don't like to hear it, but it's like one of the big caveats when you first start. A behavior is always going to get worse before it gets better because when you start to try to address it at its function and they, is like, we'll use attention as an example, and they are so used to getting attention and we pull that attention away, then it's going to, they're going to up the ante because they're like, I'm going to make you give me that attention. And so then a lot of times people are like, no, you made everything way worse, but it's just committing to it and trusting the process. Yeah. And the behavior gets worse, not in a malicious manner. When you said that I'm going to make you give me behavior, it's that their brain is going, wait, I used to do A and B would happen. And now when I do A, B isn't happening. So I need to figure out how to make B happen. So I'm going to increase the intensity or the frequency or the duration of the behavior so that I get that response that I had gotten used to. Exactly. Sometimes it leads to additional behaviors, mm -hmm. but if everybody stays consistent, word of the day, consistent, <laughs> um, if everybody stays consistent, like we said, the behaviors will go up, but then they will go down. Um, yes. That's just part of what we see because you're starting to implement something. So they're going to push back because it's not something that has been done before. They're used to the reinforcement of the attention or the escape versus the consistency of addressing the behavior to hopefully have it eventually go away. Yeah. And I, I don't mean to use Whitney's baby, but I mean, that's what babies do. You know, if they cry and you immediately go get them, and then you start to do that weaning process, <laughs> mm -hmm. then they cry longer or louder. And, you know, until they realize, oh, okay, I got to do this on my own. Right. And they start to do the self-soothing, but yeah, that's a process and it's painful. I mean, I remember doing that weaning process for my daughter and it was painful for me <laughs> to <laughs> let her cry it out and figure out how to self-soothe and, you know, stay in her bedroom when she needed to stay at bedtime and all those other things. Mm -hmm. um, so it is going to be difficult with teachers too, because as Whitney alluded to earlier, you know, they've got 15, 20, 30, maybe more kids in a classroom and they've got one who behaviors are, you know, now it'll, I thought they were at a 10 before, but now they're really at a level 10. And just trying to stick with it and be consistent, um, it does pay off. And and we, you have three people right here telling you it does pay off. You do just have to stick with it. But we all understand that that's difficult to do in the moment. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been times where we've implemented things that it, the client can get aggressive. That's just unfortunately part of working in the field. But at the end of the day, it will help the client with their behaviors. Um, and eventually, you know, a lot of them, when they start having that and they see that consistency, that's when they're more prone to open up to talking about feelings, going to see their therapist, but it just takes that consistency and communication for the team. Yeah. Well, and, and also understanding that these changes are temporary. Like if you are consistent for months and months and months and the behavior has pretty much gone away, 
and you have one shift, you go in and work and you're just not feeling it. You're like, you know what? I know we have this iPad schedule, but I'm just going to give it to you all day today because you've been doing really good and I don't feel like doing anything else. Guess what tomorrow is going to be? It is going to be an explosion because, well, I got to have it all day yesterday and, yeah. you know, just getting staff to understand, like, these aren't temporary changes. They are, you have to maintain that consist consistency long term and understand that it is better for everyone that way, but especially for the individual. Yeah. And also something that we work on, um, we did this a lot of with staff um, in residential settings, is you have to take what you are going through personally and leave it at the door. You cannot bring in, I mean, you know, when I we worked at our residential together, there was no COVID. So COVID can be a lot. My, for example, my daycare, three of the rooms are closed. My son's room is not closed, but that's kind of stressful, but I can't take that out on my clients or have, you know, when the clients are mad, they might call you a bad word. You can't take that personally. So you have to check your feelings and check what's going on with yourself at the door and be present for the client. Yeah. And something that I teach whenever I go out and teach about behaviors is that behaviors are personal to the person exhibiting the behavior, not toward the person receiving mm -hmm. the behavior. Right. Well, and so sometimes I, we'll tell parents like, you know, it's not okay that they do it right. to you, but at the end of the day, they know you're still going to be there and that you're still going to love them. So that's why you're kind of the target right now. It doesn't make it easy to accept, but they know even if they yell at you, throw something, you're still going to care about them. Or a lot of like um, foster families would see that because if the client did that before and their home family, maybe the the home family call the cops or something. You, It's just the consistency and not taking things personally will be what helps the client most. Because if they see they're, they're some of them are very, very smart. If they see you flinch, they're going to take that and run with it. So you just have to be firm and consistent. Yep, absolutely. So I want to continue with your slides. I want to make sure that we get them all in and we have about 12 minutes. So that's actually our last one. Oh, good. <laughs> resource slide. So the book, we call this the Bible of ABA. So uh -huh. this is the book and then just the link to our webpage. Awesome. That's so good. Okay, well, good. So then we can keep talking about behaviors because I just didn't, I wanted to make sure that since you put all the effort into it, I didn't want to. I mean, it. after our lunch, we figured this would end up being a lot more dialogue based than presentation based. So yeah. we kept that in mind. <laughs> we put this together. My very basic slides. We figured we'd talk about what ABA is, who we are, what we do, limitations, and then we just talk with you. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. So that's awesome. So Michael, you have had a great question. Um, and so if you have anything else that you want to ask them now is your opportunity to do so. So um, while he's thinking, or if anyone else is joining us, while well, they might be thinking of any other questions. Um, give me some examples. You talked about using ABA in HR. So like, give me some examples of how you might use ABA in a human resources area. So you look at maintaining your staff and like lowering staff turnover and something. So it would be similar to kind of like a token economy for a classroom. You could do something similar that, to that, you know, with your employees. I know at the residential that Crystal and I worked, they had something called gotcha good cards. And basically it was like if somebody just happened to see you going above and beyond something or maybe you decided to work that extra shift, even though you've already worked two shifts, you know, somebody would, I, it was like a card you'd fill out. It was like a nomination and then you'd get like a $5 gift card to Subway or something like that. Now I can tell you for a fact, there was zero behavioral principles behind that because by the time that came around, they had kind of changed their views on ABA, okay. um, but it's very, very ABA based. I mean, it's, it's very similar to those types of things. So looking at, um, just different kind of reinforcement things, um, planning, even just like staff outings, things of that nature. Um, if you have people that are tardy a lot, working on some type of procedure to help limit that, it, it really is just all behaviors, pretty much like Crystal said, lead down to those four 
functions and just determining the why can help fun like determine that i told our supervisor at one point i was like you could teach the best car salesman how to sell more cars with aba if you really really wanted to because you can just use it with anything that's incredible and to to hear you talk about these other places where it can be used when like i said most people just think most people first of all in the adult world in the corporate world don't know uh -uh. our definition of aba they may have aba that means something else but they don't right. know what this aba stands for or what it can do for them as a corporation or as a company and then to hear how it and to have the best salesman in the world be an even better salesman just mm -hmm. by applying some of these principles. I mean, that's that's incredible to me. Mm -hmm. A um, lot of, I mean, I, there's even a lot of meal planning and exercise programs that implement it. I know like Noom, they use um, cognitive behavior therapy and things like that because it's all about behavior modification. It doesn't have to be throwing chairs. Anything can be a behavior that right. you can modify. And it's, so it's just understanding when you talk behavior, that doesn't mean I'm punching holes in walls and throwing chairs. It's anything that we do and that anything can be modified or changed. And that's a lot. A lot of clients or if they have guardians don't understand that everybody has something they can work on, even if it's just communication. They may be very shy or they may have poor boundaries. There's You can do all different kinds of things with it. Like Whitney said, with health and wellness, um, even with myself, after I had my son, I had a lot of extra weight to lose. So meal planning, planning my workout, stuff like that. And then when I was doing it, I was like, wow, it's a lot of what I do for my job and I'm doing it for myself. So there's stuff like that. And we actually have a health and wellness program that if you click on that link, you can hear that um, our coworker Maddie runs and works with clients on having them, you know, make healthy decisions. Because a lot of our clients like, the sugary foods and and sodas and that so just learning about their health how they can be active um this is yeah. who's making noise if you were hearing <laughs> any noise <laughs> sorry crystal we we interrupted oh, you no no you're fine that <laughs> no that's all i was saying is that that it can be used with anything but like i said a lot of if we approach guardians about starting services with the client um, they'll say, well, they don't have any behaviors because it's just like a lot of people think to need an ABA um, program that they need to be throwing chairs at you. And that's not what it is. Everybody has something we work on. Like a lot of our clients, like I said, work on communication skills because some behaviors are because they don't know how to communicate what they're thinking, what they're feeling, stuff like that. So learning how to communicate with staff, how to communicate with peers, all those kinds of things can help decrease behaviors as well. Yeah. So Michael did ask, it was funny. I don't know if you saw his comment when you said that about, even if you're shy, you got to, and he wrote, I'm shy. So I didn't know if you had seen that as before you used that. But um, so he was curious what, what your client load is right now. Um, are you accepting new clients at Visions? Um, we are always accepting new clients at Visions. There's several BCBAs in the Southern Illinois area, but we actually cover all of Illinois. Um, we have several. We have one in Springfield. We have several up in the Chicago area. We have BCBAs in Missouri, and we actually have an office out in Oregon as well. Fabulous. And so they would, who, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, they would just go to the website you have up there. Yeah, yes. actually, um, the best way to get things going is this is our supervisor and this phone number right here um, is his direct number or you can always email him and that's how services um, can get going. That's awesome. And so, yeah, one of the things that um, I think is a misnomer is when we use the word consequences, people automatically have, those are negative consequences. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're doing, or at least in my experience, when I've done those ABC documentations, people will say, well, there was no consequence. In their heads, they're thinking, well, they didn't get in trouble or they didn't right. you know, have to stop doing or whatever. But consequence, explain consequences a little bit more. So a consequence, like if the function is a tangible, a consequence is, you know, they wanted a piece of candy. They were told no. They threw the chair. All right, here's your candy. The consequence was they got access to that piece of candy. And then that is reinforcing that behavior like, well, 
they tell me no again, I just got to throw this chair and I'm getting all the candy I want. Um, it could be getting the attention like, oh, well, so-and-so did this. So I took him out in the hallway and we walked up and down the hallway together, got one-on-one -on -one attention. If it was a task they didn't want to do, the consequence was they didn't have to complete the task. So um, yeah, a consequence, I, cause I know whenever um, I have been in IEPs, a lot of times consequences is used as like, well, their consequences was they, they, they were getting detention. It's like, well, that's not, no, I mean, that was, no, that's not how that works. <laughs> so how do you get like for ABC, what's going on before, during and after the behavior? So sometimes just changing the word to help them understand what we are asking for. Cause then, yeah, some people that's where a power struggle starts in. Well, they need a consequence. We, you know, like the level system we used to work with that was across the board, a client could have a behavior and they would be dropped from the highest level to the lowest level. And then that started to become a power struggle between the staff and client. Cause then staff would add on days, for example. So the client could be, at the lowest level and act perfect, but they had extra days on the lowest level. So they there was no incentive to be good if you're gonna keep them at the lowest level, no matter what. So just understanding that consequences doesn't mean like a punishment. Consequences right. are what happens after the behavior. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I that um, kind of a grid or triangle, I've seen it where, yeah, it's like, okay, you have to have, this percentage level of doing the behaviors that I want for X number of days. And then the next level, the percentage goes up and the number of days goes up before you can go to the next level. But I've always seen them drop. Like if they're, if it's a four tiered system and they're on tier three, then they automatically drop them all the way down to tier one. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wait, that doesn't seem right. Yep. <laughs> Right. Or like a lot of schools use the color peg system. Uh -huh. So they start, um, some are very simple, like red, green, yellow. Right. And then some have like the full kind of color spectrum based on, you know, um, so then they'll move their clip. And I see where they're going with that. But some client or, you know, some kids that can just set them off. I know my daughter personally um, at daycare, once she got clipped down from green to yellow, and then she lost it. So then she went to red because she just, she's very concerned with people being upset with her. So some people could look at that and say, oh, well, she had a behavior. She doesn't want anybody upset with her. She's always on green. She had one bad day. And then having just her clip moved to one level yeah. caused her to lose it. <laughs> And I mean, if you think about it from an adult standpoint, if you're in a corporate world, do you want a stoplight telling what your behavior, what your boss thinks your behavior is all day long? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's you know, we're supposed to be preparing these kids for the real world. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a big fan of those charts. I'm a sub now. I never had one of those charts when I taught full time. And it's really, really hard for me when I go into a classroom as a sub. And there's, like you said, most of them are not just red, yellow, and green anymore. You've got pinks and purples and uh -huh. oranges and, you know, brown. And I don't know what all the colors are. And I tend to and we didn't even really get focused an opportunity to talk about this, but the positive behaviors, like I'm always moving kids up, you know, like, Oh, I caught you. Like you said earlier, but in the, in the home that you worked That's in, you know, good. caught you being good, you know, mm -hmm. oh, Hey, I told you to be quiet and you got quiet, go move up. You know? Well, I guess I, I actually had an entire, I think it was a kindergarten class at the end of the day, got to go to the treasure box because I had moved them all up so much. And apparently like once they get to the top, they get to go to the treasure box. And yeah. so I had like 20 kids at the end of the day going, oh, we get to go to the treasure box. I'm like, oh, that's probably not how the teacher intended it. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of times people do forget to focus on the good and they focus on the negative. And then that kid's only associated with all of the negative things they do and nothing positive. like. Maybe the kid has a hard time reading, and so the behaviors are around reading, but he's like the sweetest kid outside of that, but that gets ignored. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We try to focus on the positives and find their strengths, and those are included in our behavior plans as well. Yeah, that's perfect. 
perfect way to end. And we do have to end. Um, as I said, we could talk for hours and mm -hmm. I just don't have enough space to do that. So I mm -hmm. so appreciate you. Maybe we'll have you ladies back sometime. Make Absolutely. sure if you're yeah. in a need for a BCBA that you reach out to me or, and I can connect you or you reach directly out to Crystal or Whitney. Thanks everybody. Have a great week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hey, parents and teachers, are you tired of IEP meetings that feel like a battle? Let's put an end to the tension and create a collaborative, calm, and respectful environment together. Shelly Kino, your go-to IEP consultant, can transform your meetings into positive and productive experiences. With Shelly Kino, your child is her top priority, your voice is heard, and you become confident. Shelly Kino is making the world better for all, one IEP at a time. Visit www.shellykino.com for more information and set up your free 20-minute consultation today. That's shellykino.com, S-H-E-L-L-E-Y-K-E-N-O-W.